each one of you present here today. It's absolutely a pleasure to host all of you at the Deaf Expo 2022. A wonderful Tuesday morning and some wonderful faces that I can see. So firstly, uh, thank you very, very much for joining us this morning. Very interesting session, very insightful session, very amazing esteemed speakers are going to come right here on stage and share their insights with all of us. And the topic for this session is Future of Conflict Technologies, Outer Space, Deep Ocean and the Cyber World as Key Domains of Conflict. I believe that this session will top all the other seminars in helping stakeholders take informed decisions, in helping users and providers to better understand the kinetics of future conflicts in the region. So without further ado, let's invite all our esteemed speakers one by one on stage. Mr. Toby Simon, Founder President, Synergia Foundation. Sir, if I can request, let's have a huge round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. Our session moderator for this session, Mr. Toby Simon, Founder President, Synergia Foundation. Thank you, sir. Up next, we have Air Marshal Rajiv Dayal Mathur to kindly come on stage. Let's have a huge round of applause for Air Marshal Rajiv Dayal Mathur, please. Thank you, sir. Up next, we have Brigadier General Robert Mazzalin, who has also joined us via video conferencing. Most warm, warm welcome, sir. Thank you very much for joining in. Next up, we have Major General Moni Chandy. Can I request you, sir, to kind of general for U.S. Army Pacific. Let's have a huge round of applause, ladies and gentlemen, for these esteemed speakers right here on stage who have joined us. Thank you very much. All right, let's begin this session by inviting our session moderator. Mr. Toby Simon is the founder and president of Synergia Foundation, a strategic do tank which works to develop impactful insights in the areas of geoeconomics, geopolitics, and geosecurity. He has over 35 years of experience in biosecurity, cybersecurity, aerospace and defense, telecommunications, strategic technologies, and international affairs. He is the Commissioner of the Global Commission on the Internet Governance, chaired by the former Swedish Prime Minister, Carl Bildt. He is a member of the Trilateral Commission, a group of global leaders formed by Henry Kissinger and David Rockefeller in the year 1973. He served on the advisory board for the Center for New American Security in Washington, D.C. as an International Council member, both at the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs at the John F. Kennedy School at Harvard University at the Harris School of Public Policy at the University of Chicago. He has Master's in Business Administration, is a university topper, and was a special invitee of the Indian Prime Minister in 1988. He is a graduate of the Harvard Business School and a research associate at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He is currently pursuing his doctoral studies in international security. Please put your hands together, ladies and gentlemen, with hearty warm welcome, if I may invite our session moderator, so, Mr. Toby Simon. So. Uh, good morning, everybody. First of all, I just I must apologize that we have been a, a few minutes late. We were trying to get more people into the auditorium, but we said we will start and let people watch uh, what we are speaking and hearing through the video. So, it's a delight to welcome you all uh, to the Dev Expo 2022 on the on the seminar the future of uh, conflicts, outer space, deep sea, and cyber, organized by the Synergia Foundation. Why are we here? So that's the first question. We are here basically to manage what we call predictable surprises, managing both the unknown unknown and the known unknown. We believe that this topic, that the topic that we have chosen, after uh, a considerable amount of research, the future of conflicts will lie at the core of what Deaf Expo means, as we fundamentally align the uh, interest of the buyer, the manufacturer, the strategic thinker, and the vendor. It would be unwise for either of the stakeholders to plan or build inventories without knowing how the theater of conflict will pan out in this region in the coming years. Before proposing this topic, uh, I've asked several vendors, large companies, buyers, uh, in the recent past, what they felt would be perhaps the outline of the conflict, and few had a good answer. We would, we would continue to work on this topic and will encourage most of you to sort of work with us to see how we can sort of uh, bring more insight to this. this. May I just briefly introduce the Synergia Foundation. We are a, a strategic do-tank 
and we believe uh, we are an aggregation of some of the finest experts, mostly practitioners from all over the world, and provide non-partisan insights uh, to an evidence-based information to key decision makers in many parts of the world. We provide thought leadership and bespoke advice to governments and industry and over the last 35 years have demonstrated this ability in areas including supply chain, engineering, cybersecurity, telecommunication, satellite communication, aerospace and defense, and semiconductors. All things have, all of these topics are one thing which is common, that the underbelly of all of them is security. This is the fourth year in a trot that Synergy has had the opportunity to present uh, our insights at the DEF Expo. And we, are also be, we also have been called to do the same thing at Aero India. We are immensely grateful to the Ministry of Defense for giving us uh, such an opportunity. I have a very distinguished set of experts here and I wouldn't want to steal their thunder. But before I invite them to speak, let me set out the context. Number one, future conflicts will not be a precise science. It will remain an unpredictable and uniquely human activity. Number two, qualitative advantage may no longer be assumed for the future. Number three, RMA or revolutionary, revolutionary military affairs focus on concepts like rapid, rapid effect leading to a belief in the, in the late 20th and 21st century that major powers could define wars might not hold true. Seemingly inverse, uh, inferior adversaries will be able to achieve tactical success because of their access to alternate sources of cheaper technology and their rate of adaption, adoption will be faster. Number five, the motives for enga engaging in conflicts have been described using the concept of fear, honor and interest. Force of good or honor was used to justify many military engagements and now it might end up, end up to be the force of fear. There is a sense that we may be currently focused too much on equipments. Number seven, and I think this is the most important thing in, in, in the coming years, is the centrality of influence. If the character of the last military era was defined by a country's ability to conduct precision strikes on enemy plat platforms and command nodes, the future of conflicts are likely to be defined more by the centrality of influence. Our adversaries have already recognized the strategic importance of influencing public perception and will continue to develop this and use increasingly sophisticated methods. The battle of the narratives, as we call it, which is not just a matter of improved public affairs or perception, will take place in a decentralized network and free market full of ideas, opinions, and even a set of raw data, which will weaken immediacy and, inf and weaken the influence of mainstream news media. Breaking events will be increasingly transmitted to individuals at ever higher tempo, often without government or editorial filters or legal sanctions and safeguards. Although the propaganda of D is well established and frequently demonstrated, modern technology will amplify this shock. Number eight, Technology affects the way in which a force is able to fight and credibly of that force to deter. However, however, the vanguard of development is shifting towards the private sector, which typically is more agile and than the military it supports. And this is perhaps moving to the east. I conclude by saying the future character of conflict will challenge military forces structured and prepared for industrial age war between global, global superpowers. Thank you very much. Now let me introduce, uh, let me welcome uh, Air Marshal Rajiv Mato uh, to first take his stage and share his insights. Good morning ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> I shall be addressing this select audience on the aspect of outer space as a key domain of conflict in the near future. Today, more than 80 nations run space programs. Space is highly congested with over 6,400 active satellites in orbit. There are almost 50,000 pieces of space debris of measurable size. And when I say measurable, it means 10 centimeters plus, which is orbiting the Earth. Besides this, space has become very important to us in terms of commercial aspects.
We've got so used to using GPS for navigation. We need weather satellites to tell us about weather at different places. We need broadband internet connectivity through satellite. That's what's happening through Starlink in Ukraine right now and everything else is cut off. And every day, our activities on Earth depend so largely on assets placed in space. Let me list off some of the changes that have occurred in recent times. Firstly, communication satellites, they were earlier primarily in geostationary Earth orbit. They have moved to a large extent to low Earth orbit because of the lesser time period, that is latency, for signals to travel between the Earth and the satellite. Also, they have better revisit frequency when they are in low Earth orbit. There's also an increase in the number of positioning constellations besides the GPS, which is, of course, operated by the United States of America. We have systems run by Russia, China, the European Space Agency, Japan, and India in terms of both global and regional networks. The private sector has emerged as a major player, especially since 2009. You're aware of what SpaceX is doing. Today, Global private investment in space is in excess of 25 billion US dollars. And this is only expected to grow in the years ahead. Again, because of miniaturization of electronics, satellites have become smaller and smaller in size. And this is leading to a large number of cuboid small satellites which are much more efficient, much more easier to launch, and much more cost effective. Because of use of Retrievable and reusable materials, as has been shown again by SpaceX when they are retrieving their launchers. The launch cost per unit weight has reduced and would continue to reduce in the years ahead. Space tourism is growing, and along with the rest of space assets, it's expected that in the next two decades or so, we could have a space economy which has grown to almost a trillion dollar economy. So there's a long way to go in terms of usage of space for civilian purposes. There have been technological improvements as well, which has improved satellite communication. Satellite communications have become more secure because of use of laser technology. Also, the terms, in terms of data rate, laser technology has ensured that data rates are much higher data rates are possible using lasers. Also, in terms of remote sensing resolutions, these are improving by the day, both for electro-optical and for synthetic aperture data. Today it's commonplace to see 40 centimeter resolution via CapSat 3, which gives 25 centimeter resolution. And soon, in the next couple of years, we could be coming down to 10 centimeter resolution. So all this has resulted in more and more applications of remote sensing. What are the future possibilities? And here I'm talking about the near future, perhaps even the next decade or so. Decade or so. Satellite servicing vehicles is a concept that is already under consideration by the European Space Association. We would be using such vehicles to refurbish, replenish, that is refuel, and perhaps move satellites that have come down into a low orbit to reboost them into higher orbits. So this is a field where there's a lot of opportunity that could present itself. Point-to-point -point transportation over the surface of the Earth over large distances is again a concept that SpaceX is looking at in terms of using launch vehicles to get into space then move across the surface of the Earth to another place. This would take some time to develop, but it's a technology that is in the pipeline. Space mining of both asteroids and of the Moon for rare earth metals, as well as for iron, nickel and cobalt, would create areas where there could be conflict, where interests of nations clash with each other. After debris removal missions are already in the pipeline, of course, this has been done by the space shuttle earlier, but we are looking at removing the excess of debris, which, is, which could prove to be a problem in subsequent years through autonomous robotic removal onto lower orbits. Of course, space has always been considered as the ultimate high ground, and there has been military activity, perhaps more overt than covert, in the last few years. There is military activity, operations in space, which include use of proximity uh, operations in terms of satellites, use of lasers.
lasers as weapons between satellites, their military operations from space, which could be usage of anti-ballistic missile weapons or usage of satellite to surface of the Earth weapons. There are also military operations to space, which include kinetic anti-satellite weapons and lasers. Also military operations through space, which include transiting ballistic missiles. Space assets, of course, are used to support activities on Earth. We are all aware of the assets for remote sensing being used for ISR operations. Missile tracking in terms of picking up the location of the launch of ballistic missiles, tracking the ballistic missile to find the ultimate point of impact. Also in terms of command and control of all operations, both on land and sea as well as in the air, is a major part of what space applications are being used for in terms of military operations. So with all this, the situation is rife for conflict in the near future. All these technologies can be used for multiple purposes, both civilian and with military applications. We know that GPS could be used for navigation on ground, but at the same time it is used for precision weapon targeting. Space derived services, be it telecommunications, be it navigation, be it weather forecasting, could be interrupted. And this interruption could, even if it's unintentional, lead to conflict. Therefore, space-based systems have become lucrative targets because they affect both the economic and military potential of a nation. And therefore, if targeted, they can really put down the potential at the national level. There are also certain key orbital slots in space. These are called the Lagrange points, the L1, L2, L3, L4, L5, which are points of relative stability where satellites can be parked for prolonged periods of time. Now these are limited in number, simply in terms of what's called cislunar space, that's the space between the Earth and the Moon and the sphere formed with this radius. So these are spaces where there are limited assets in terms of slots that are available. And therefore, this could be a region of conflict between nations because <clears throat> why for each of these slots would create conflict. Deep sea exploration and space mining, be it for rare earth metals as I said, or for other metals like iron, nickel, or cobalt, could again place nations in conflict with each other. So certain actions definitely are required to ensure that we avoid these areas of conflict. Today, in terms of space situational awareness of what is happening in space, there is limited information available with all players. Of course, the United States is the major player in terms of space situational awareness, space traffic management, and in terms of debris removal. However, it is felt that if there was larger transparency in what is happening in orbit, then it would lead to more equitable utilization of resources and there would be lesser chances of conflict. More and more players from the private sector have got into uh, the space segment. Also, technology has increased and improved at a much faster rate than regulations have been able to keep pace with it. Therefore, there is a need for new regulation where we have more private sectors also being part of the agreement process so that uh, agreements that are reached are more adherable by all parties concerned. We need to clearly define the rules of proximity passes of satellites of other nations so that there is less, less of mistrust in terms of satellites coming close to each other and not being aware of what the purpose for the close proximity is. And of course, to reduce the amount of debris in orbit, you need to ban intentional destruction of orbits of satellites and other objects in orbit. Again, 
all nations need to get together to get through this congestion that is taking place right now, especially in growth orbit, by facilitating active debris removal missions. I think some of the slides were missed out. There are certain shortcomings of the existing system. Firstly, in terms of, I don't know, I, those slides seem to be missing from this. In terms of regulation, we have the 1967 Outer Space Treaty. And of course, this was uh, between 1967 and 1979. There were some other agreements. There was the Liability Convention, there was the Registration Convention, there was the Rescue Agreement, there was the Moon Treaty, but all these were basically embedded in the Cold War process. They addressed weapons of mass destruction placed in orbit or in celestial bodies. They do not address the problems as they are today. The United Nations Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, COPOS, uh, works by consensus. It has got legal and scientific uh, departments. It's got uh, uh, other areas where people cooperate with each other, but all what is agreed upon by this body is through consensus. And as we all understand, wherever we have to get on to consensus, consensus, it's very difficult to get on to a real hard, address the real hard core issues. Therefore, these, these bodies have not really been able to address the core issues in terms of problems in space. Therefore, there's a need of a new foundational view, which is more equitable in nature, which perhaps addresses all the problems as they exist today, and which caters to the future participation of private players on a much larger scale in all these space operations. But the question is, who will build the cat? As I said earlier, to be aware of what's happening in space, we have to first see what is in space. To see what is in space, we have to have a space Situational awareness, a space surveillance network, space traffic management. Today these capabilities are very limited, primarily in the hands of the United States of America. To a certain extent, more so in the southern hemisphere by Russia. To some extent by China. But the major player in this is the United States. And we can say without doubt that whatever nation today holds power holds key would be very loath to part with it. So that's the question that, that primarily exists, that who will build the gap in terms of ensuring that these things are more equitably distributed, that there is greater, greater clarity amongst nations regarding placement of objects in orbit, objects that could have weaponized content. So these are issues that need to be discussed. So I have a few uh, uh, points where I feel that we need uh, positive action. One is, uh, as I said, have clearly defined rules of proximity passes to satellites of other nations, uh, facilitate that debris removal, so that is a slide that played through. Uh, finally, we must understand that space has become mighty for military operations. In fact, most armed forces have reorganized their military formations right from the United States, which have the United States Space Force under the Unified uh, Space Command. They have, as part of the uh, as a Space Force, they have the Space Operations Command, which is embedded into the Unified uh, Space Command. Similarly, the US, uh, similarly, Russia, China have modified their formations to include war fighting in space as a domain which is very likely in the near future. We ourselves have created the Defense Space Agency and are, and are looking forward to expand its scope. Space-based networks are vital for a nation's economy, both in terms of its economic growth and in terms of its military potential. Satellites, as we've seen, have predictable orbits. They, have, they work on radio frequencies which can be jammed. They are fragile. Therefore, they are vulnerable as targets. Therefore, any adversary space access become a very lucrative target. Therefore, we see all this, we find that competition in space is surely 
and inexorably leading towards conflict. And therefore, it's essential that rules of the road be definitely formulated. To conclude, I will say that achievement of global prosperity through space commerce could well be the greatest incentive for nations to jointly keep outer space secure. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for the presentation. All right, up next, it's time to invite our next speaker. Major General Smith is the Deputy Commanding General for the U.S. Army Pacific, located at Fort Shafter, Havana. Prior to his arrival at USARPAC, he served as the Director General, Land Operations of the Australian Army. His other senior appointments include Director General Strategic Planning, Army, Director Plans, Army Chief of Staff to the Chief of the Defence Force and Chief of the Defence Force Liaison Officer to the Chairman of Joint Chief of Staff. So with so much credit, let's invite our next speaker, Major General Smith, to kindly come on. Thank you so much. First, um, thanks, Toby. You're a very persuasive person, and I appreciate the opportunity for, for, for speaking. I, I, I stand here not as an expert in, um, in space, undersea warfare, or cyber, but as a, as a uh, land warfare practitioner. So if you don't mind, I would like to make a connection between space and, and warfare. And what I'd like to do is give you a sense of developments in space and what it seems to be doing to warfare both on the land and, and warfare between the land and, and the sea. And my, my sense is that, um, and you can, some of this you can see watching your television about warfare in the, in the Ukraine, is that um, ubiquitous sensors, particularly sensors in, in space, means that in warfare these days it's very difficult to hide. So if you are caught in the open and you can match your sensors with precision long range strike, then you have the capacity to, to um, control open space in a way that potentially we haven't in the past. The implication, as many of you have seen, that where Russian forces and Ukrainian forces that have been caught in the open have been easily picked off and destroyed. I think the implication for this, for land warfare, is that it's forcing warfare into tighter and tighter spaces. And I think that probably the best um, example of this was the fighting to push ISIS out of northern Iraq. Many of you will be familiar that that was largely a battle for a, for a series of cities. And I think that, that you can see there where Western coalition air power and, of course, space sensors were able to see and with precision strike, strike anything in the open. The only place that ISIS had to sort of equalise the battlefield was to withdraw into, into close spaces. And then only once in the close spaces they could coalesce, inform bodies and then resist... Um, to retain control of, um, of terrain. So I think that that's one of the, the key um, implications. You, if you can match long range strike and the ubiquitous sensors that can see everywhere, it forces battle into close spaces. But I think the other implication is that if you take that idea and you translate it to maritime spaces, and given the emerging um, range and precision of land-based strike and anti-ship missiles in particular, I think it ha might potentially have really important implications. The, the, there is the potential now for land-based strike to strike out to a thousand kilometres at sea. The implication is that potentially you can exercise not just sea denial, but sea control from the land. And I think that's important because if you uh, if one ships, you know, that once upon a time had the luxury of sort of disappearing into the open ocean and then reappearing in places unexpected, that can't happen anymore. Ships are easily discovered in the ocean. And to some extent, um, well at least at this stage, um, offensive, so the attacker with missiles has the advantage. So therefore the ships are at somewhat of a disadvantage. So, so if you imagine, for example, that you know a single ship with, I don't know, 20 or 30 um, missile launching pods if you sink that ship, you lose the, the missiles and you lo lose the launching capacity. But you can disperse 30 launchers on the land. Each of them requires a separate missile to destroy them. Each of them are uh, much harder to discover on land. And I think that perhaps what we might be seeing emerging is um, an advantage of land, the land domain, over the maritime domain. 
And I think it has significant consequences. If you look now, you can see that China, um, by um, um, linking its space sensors with its long-range strikes, um, potentially with some of the developing uh, new ballistic missiles with the range of precision can, can uh, influence the sea from the land quite extensively. And I think it has some serious implications that um, maritime and land forces will have to consider. But the principal problem is that if you want to restore some sort of manoeuvre to the sea and, and land battlefield, you know, how do you get across these sort of vast new no man's lands or, or um, anti-access area denial, denial bubbles is the other colloquial term. How do you move through those safely? I think the implication at the moment is that the defence and the defender has the, the great advantage, but the challenge now, I think, is how do you restore the capacity to manoeuvre? I suspect, and this is where I'll leave the discussion to, to plant a seed for some thoughts, is that maybe the day of the exquisite large platform I think that the greatest expression of that is the aircraft carrier. Potentially the day of that is over and then maybe we need to start looking at the sort of solutions that, you know, something similar to how we overcome the challenge of the stabilised front on the Western Front in the First World War of getting large numbers through this new no man's land and potentially that is many small, cheap and autonomous to get material and troops and so on through these spaces, whether it's either on land or the, the, the vast distances to cross oceans. But anyway, I'll leave it at that and hopefully that adds some food for thought for the discussion. I apologise too, by the way, I'm going to have to leave the discussion early, but uh, hopefully that adds some value to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much for doing this for us. All right, next up, we have our speaker who is going to join us through video conferencing. Brigadier General Robert Mazalin is a CIGI senior fellow and serves as the chief technology strategist at RIA Group, an international company providing bespoke engineering solutions, system development and security services for space, military, government and other critical infrastructure. General Mazalin has served in various key command and staff roles at all ranks during his military service. Prior to his retirement, he was the first foreign flag officer to serve at the United States Cyber Command as the Vice Director for Strategic Policy, Plan Force Development and Training. Throughout his career, he has chaired and participated in various multinational engineering security, interoperability and standardization programs within the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, the Five Eyes Alliance and related military, government and commercial. So please put your hands together as I invite him and welcome him. Thank you so much, sir, for joining in. It's absolutely our pleasure. Thank you very much. Over to you. Well, thank you very much, ma'am. I appreciate the kind uh, invitation to participate in, the, in this, uh, in this uh, August forum. Uh, I've prepared some, um, a, a bit of a deck, so I'll give it a try to, to share it here. And hopefully it appears on, on the screen. <laughs> Just a, a quick check. Do, do you see the deck? Uh, Hopefully you manage to see the deck. Is there a presentation, sir? We can't. We can just see you. Yes, I, I just uh, just tried sharing it. Sure, sir. We can't see it as of now. Yes, you can share it once you again. You can. If you can you see share it? your screen, sir. Yes, I've uh, done that. No, sir. We still can't see the presentation. If you can just close it, then okay. reshare it again, please. Yeah. So, uh, if we can take the next speaker, meanwhile, we can fix this technical Actually, thing. Actually, the other screen is showing the panel here. Oh, I think I've got it. 
One second, sir. One you second. have a second screen which is showing the panel here, and one is on hand. Sure. Okay, sir, we'll just fix this. Meanwhile, uh, we'll take the next speaker, if that's okay, if you allow me that, please. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Like they say, technical technology is a boon and a bane. So, of course, we'll wait for a while until we'll invite our next speaker on stage. Major General Modi Chandi is the Chief Strategic Officer at the Synergia Foundation. He's a retired Indian Army officer who brings to the foundation skills of a soldier, an engineer, a counter-terrorist commander, a UN peacemaker and a security professional. A former Major General and Inspector General of the Elite National Security Guard, he's an enthusiastic analyst, an articulate speaker and a prolific writer. Please, ladies and gentlemen, as I... Warmly invite our next speaker, Major Jenny Moni Chani, on the dice, please. Thank you, sir. Now, I remain convinced with that argument even today, 
and having served in the United Nations twice, I know I'm not happy to say this, but in the United Nations, people attribute the Indian Armed Forces and Pakistan Armed Forces as two of the most professional armed forces in the world. So when we can say that there is space for conventional war beneath a nuclear threshold in the India-Pakistan conflict, I'm not sure whether we have the same confidence when we talk about other states. But the answer to that question is not the lesson that I draw. The answer, the question, the lesson I draw is this. While aggressive superpowers, like Russia in this case, may have hoped for a quick, decisive victory, smaller nation states like Ukraine may be able to bleed them in an extended conflict, provided they can absorb the initial shock and awe, and their armed forces continue to receive support from its citizens. So what I'm trying to say here is that the nuclear war has broken two myths, and I think those are important myths. The first myth is that if you're a nuclear power, you don't have to engage in conventional war. I think that myth has been broken many, many times. And the second myth is that if you're a nuclear power and you neglect your conventional deterrence, even a non-nuclear power can bleed you. And that's perhaps what we are seeing is happening in the Ukraine conflict. The second lesson I want to draw is the impact of offensive cyber operations. Now, offensive cyber operations is a new arsenal in the inventory of modern armed forces. And when Russia went into Ukraine in February this year, they used this capability to good effect. They were able to disrupt internet, internet services over Ukraine. They were able to hack this satellite which I've shown there. It's a commercial satellite called Biosat, which was providing communication in Ukraine. They hacked into the satellite and disrupted the service. They were able to hack onto government websites and they were able to disrupt utility services like electric power and communications. But two weeks later, that changed. And I think that's the remarkable change and I think that's what Air Marshal Mathur also alluded to. How did that remarkable change take place? This is what caused it. SpaceX Starlink. Now, Elon Musk had 2,000 satellites, 2,000 small satellites that you see in that visual there, and he brought these satellites to bear over Ukraine. And then he gave Ukraine 16,000 ground stations. And the 16,000 ground stations were distributed and they connected to this what he calls a constellation of satellites. And they were back on the internet. Vladimir Zelensky could address the UN General Assembly. He could address NATO. And he was in our houses on TV. All the internet utilities were restored. And more important, a lot of internet-based technologies were introduced which could actually support the war. So the lesson was this, while offensive cyber operations, the new uh, you know, arsenal which modern armed forces has, can initially be successful, cyber systems will not only be restored, but internet-based military applications for intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance, and artillery control can be developed quickly. So that's the second lesson that we drew from this. Look at the third lesson. The third lesson pertains to drones, but if you see in the headline I've written 3A because I think the real grain changer is going to be 3B. Now, when Russia went into Crimea eight years ago, in 2014, they had a range of drones for various performances and these were some of the drones that they had. They had the Aileron 3SV, which is a reconnaissance drone. They had the Zala KYB, which is a kamikaze drone carrying about 3 kgs of explosive. And if you look at that visual, you can see a swarm of drones approaching a ship. Now that was the kind of threat which they thought they could manifest. 
And then you have the Orland 10, which is a medium range uh, multi UPD drone. And the last one is the Konstrat Orion, which is like the US Predator, a large uh, drone uh, going by the acronym MAIL, which means medium altitude long endurance. Uh, it can have four weapon pods and you can put a variety of munitions out of it. So when they went in, in Crimea, they were uncontested. But eight years later, when they invaded Ukraine, Ukraine was prepared. And they were met with this, the Bayraktar, a Turkish drone which Ukraine bought from Turkey. It's also a large drone, like I mentioned, like the Konstrat and the Predator. But they also had their own drones, the SM Furia and the Ledeka, uh, which are reconnaissance drones and also can be used for artillery uh, directions. But the real game changer, as I mentioned, was 3D. It's too loud. Is it okay now? Okay, thank you. The real game changer is what you see in this lab. That is loiter weapons. Now what are loiter weapons? Loiter weapons are fired over a battle area and the weapons which are used in Ukraine have a loiter time of 30 minutes to 60 minutes. But there are other systems which can have loiter times up to 2 hours. And the weapon system loiters over the battle space until it acquires a target. And when it acquires a target, which can either be automatic or manually controlled, it reconfigures itself into a kamikaze drone and it attacks the top of the vehicle. Now most A vehicles, as you know, are well protected, but they have relatively smaller protection on top. So these are called as top attack weapons. So you can see these two weapon systems. One is fired off a vehicle called the Ram 2, and the other is called the Silent Thunder, both manufactured in Ukraine. But as I mentioned, initially it was a Ukrainian army and a Russian army with a similar inventory. But as the war progressed, 31 nations of the Western Alliance provided a range of weapons and equipment to Ukraine. And the easiest way you can provide assistance is by rolling it off your own inventory. So a lot of weapon systems came, including these two, which is the switchblade manufactured by a US company called uh, Air Environment, and the Phoenix Ghost manufactured by AVEX Aerospace and spend a moment and think about this and see why I'm calling it a game changer because it has a fundamental impact on the land battle. The first change which you see is that in army circles we call the tank the king of the battlefield because it's got firepower, mobility and protection. But if you can fire a range of loiter weapons, you might be able to stall a tank. So it fundamentally questions the primacy of the tank. The second is that in advances, in the advanced operation of war across all militaries, we prefer to be led by mechanized forces. And mechanized forces, if they are confronted with a swarm of loiter weapons, and you can take out maybe three or five, you know, A vehicles in 10 minutes. You might be able to stall that. So that's the second major implication as to why this is a game changer. And the third reason I call it a game changer is that we talk of the non-linear nature of the battlefield. It's no longer armies facing one another. But you hit the areas in the rear which are vulnerable, like air defense weapon sites logistic hubs, communication centers, and tactical headquarters. And they become increasingly vulnerable to precision attacks. Now the fourth lesson that emerges from here is the impact of man types. Now man types are man portable air defense systems which can be fired by a single soldier. Now the US used this to good effect in Afghanistan when they armed the Mujahideen with this and the armed and the man pads, which were mainly the stinger, uh, was able to put a dent in 
Russia's control of the airspace. Now when these 31 nations had to give assistance, one of the first things they did is that they proliferated man banks and large numbers of them. In the first consignment, 2,000 man bags, the Stella Stinger man bag manufactured by lithium, the US provided it to the Ukrainian armed forces. And then the UK produced this, provided the second one, which is called a Star Street, manufactured by Thales. And there's a new player you can see there, that's South Korea, which provided the Chiron. Now, when you proliferate the tactical battle area with man bags, it has two very profound impacts on the battlefield. The first is helicopter operations become vulnerable. And the second is something which is very important to ground forces, which is called as close air support, which is normally given at low altitudes, becomes difficult. So one of the cautions which came is that fixed wing aircraft providing close air support tried to provide it at altitudes above four and a half kilometers. And if they came below four and a half kilometers, they became vulnerable. Like you can see that wreckage of the Russian Su-35 there. So the lesson is proliferation of man pads in Ukraine severely impeded Russia's helicopter operations in the tactical battle area, as well as close air support operations by fixed wing aircraft at altitudes below four and a half kilometers. The fifth lesson is another very interesting lesson. It's called long range precision fires. And this is a capability which all nations want to acquire. And what you see there is the M142 Hanmars manufactured by Lockheed Martin. And it's, uh, there's a lot of publicity about it. But the interesting part of the specifications is that it can either fire six multi-barrel rockets to an altitude, to a range of 90 kilometers, or it can fire one guided missile to a range of 300 kilometers. Now, you would have, those of you uh, who followed the Ukraine war, you would have noticed these two things happened. You know, the attack on the Saki air base on 9th August, and the attack on Kerch Ridge on 8th October. Now, Ukraine hasn't specified how exactly those attacks were carried out, but if I could hazard a professional guess, they are the impact of guided missiles with precision guidance at ranges close to 300 kilometers. So the lesson is long-range precision fires accentuates the non-linear nature of future battlefields. The tactical battle area in Ukraine extends 300 kilometers from frontline troops and all assets in that extended TBA is fair game. Now the last lesson I want to draw is perhaps uh, the most impactful and uh, one in which the greatest possible uh, you know, development can take place. And that is the propaganda war. Now, propaganda isn't a new tool. Uh, nations have been using it for centuries, virtually as old as warfare itself. But the fact is we live in the information age and there are now means to reach a much wider audience than you ever reached before. Both Ukraine and Russia used propaganda in this warfare. A lot of war efforts and a um, lot of resources. But if there is a clear winner in the propaganda war, it was neither Ukraine nor was it Russia. It was the US. And the proof of the pudding is in the eating. Because US propaganda, and I think all of us can learn from this, was delivered with such style and such finesse that in Europe itself, they went in for sanctions against Russia, even though it was against their own economic interest, and they're perhaps realizing it eight months down the line. And I think that is the quality of good propaganda, to manage the perceptions of other people in a manner in which it serves your national interest. So the last lesson is, in the information age, particularly in democratic societies, it is important to build and control a public narrative that supports the war effort. Now, that's the answer to the first question, the six important lessons from the Ukraine war, uh, from which I think will have a profound impact on the future of warfare. The second question was, what lessons should India imbibe from the Russo-Ukraine war? And I think this is a direct application to, of the answer to the first question. Prepare for conventional war, 
Remember the two myths I said? Nuclear powers don't engage in conventional war is a myth. All nuclear powers engage in conventional war. And if you live with the first myth and you are lethargic or complacent about your conventional deterrent, a non-nuclear power like Ukraine can give you a bloody nose. So I think that's an important lesson. The second is offensive cyber. But perhaps more important to offensive cyber is the counter to offensive cyber. If SpaceX can throw up a constellation of 2,000 small satellites, can ISRO do something similar? I'm sure people in ISRO must be thinking about it, but I think that's the capacity which we need to develop. A constellation of small satellites. Drone and counter drone capacities. Drones have proliferated the battlefield, but what's the counter to it? Now you cannot use the S-400, which fires a million dollar missile, to down a $200 drone. We need something which is shorter fired, which has a range of two or three kilometers, and which, is, which has a high, rate, high accuracy. Counter to man tanks. Now this is a battle of technology right now. The advantage is with man pads in the tactical battle area. But if we have to resume the air maneuver with helicopters and close air support, we need to find a counter to man pads. And I didn't find that in the Ukraine war. Long range precision fires. I've covered it, guided missiles into the future. And uh, I'll dwell on this in my last subject. This is the area where future warfare, at least land battle, should be taking us. And the last question I mentioned was the management of public perceptions. The last question I had was where should India's Atmanirbhar efforts need to be focused? I believe India's greatest wealth is our children. And if you see the way multinational corporations are employing our children in foreign lands, it's a very good indication of their capability. And we can use our own children young people to find answers to these problems and I've got four areas which I would like to suggest. The first as I mentioned is counter drone warfare, a shoulder fired system where you can down a drone. The second is space based SATA. By SATA is an acronym for surveillance and cloud acquisition. Now I think the Air Marshal also mentioned it. That is the future. You need to have something where you can acquire the target from space. And if I can add it to the other two areas which I said, what I feel you need to have is, if there's a threat, the threat still exists, but that threat should be monitored in space. It should be relayed to a monitoring station which could be thousands of kilometers away from that base. And from there you analyze the target and you fire a weapon system which could be, in this case, 300 kilometers from the target but it has a precision targeting system and you can take it out. So that is the kind of loop which I think the immediate future should look for us. Control of airspace over the TPA, the proliferation of man pads, I covered that, and long range precision fires. So I've completed my presentation there. Thank you very much. Have got authenticated objective data and done an unbiased analysis for us to draw major lessons. For us to see a couple of tanks being knocked off by some precision strikes on the TV and to deduce that the era of tanks is gone is I think a little bit premature. If you see the origin of tank and with that I would equate it with any kind of military technology. There is always a cycle. Right from the First World War, where the tanks first came on the battlefield, till date, there is a continuous competition between tanks versus anti-tank. And when you find a particular technology to defeat the protection levels that are there in the armor, you upgrade your capability of protection. You upgrade your mobility, which also enhances your, your survival. And so on and so forth. 
take your mind back to 1973, the Yom Kippur War. It was the first time the anti-tank guided missiles really were seen on the battlefield, producing their, their effect when used in swamps. People at that time had predicted the end of tanks. We did not have it. came out with compound off and so on and so forth. So when the side and the front armor became too strong, you come up with the top attack munitions. A further manifestation or improvement of top, top attack munitions is the loiter munitions as the chandelier. But go and beyond, just hold your horses five years down the line, ten years down the line, the tanks will adapt. <coughs> they will find a solution. And similarly for the drone and the counter drone. This cyclic process of you know a new technology emerging and creating a disproportionate effect till something counter to that is, is discovered or invented, designed, is, is a process that continues. So while drones today may be a swarm drones and, and different utilization is there for drones from, from the ISR versions to the combatized versions, to the logistic versions, but soon you will start having counter drone technology which did not be a million dollar missile. And therefore, the, the discontinuous race would still be on and we should not prematurely kind of pronounce the end of a particular kind of weapon system which has withstood test of time. Now coming to the information warfare, this particular war is giving you two very stark yeah. examples. One side is completely trying to dominate the information space with huge amount of bombardment of information and the entire social media, internet, TV, everything. The other side is saying hardly anything. And yet, neither side has given up. So while Ukraine certainly has managed to sustain their own morale, as also the support from the Western world. The unity of the Western world has not been affected or undermined. But at the same time, what everybody had predicted that when the body bags start going home, the support for war in Russia would start diminishing and Putin would find it difficult. But it is still eight months and they have not given up. And they are not trying to influence the other world as much as the Western world. So you have two very strong examples. So what is the lesson that we need? There are a couple of lessons. That A, to support your propaganda war or to build a narrative, you want to have a narrative. So you need to create something on ground. It cannot, I mean you can create, you can use the social media, you can create millions of bots. But the story or narrative that they are trying to propagate has to be credible. Because the same technology today enables a lot of transparency. You publish a story, in a couple of minutes somebody will be able to do a fact check and say whether the story is true or not. So therefore you need to have a credible narrative to give. And ultimately, unless that narrative telling influences the behavior, what is the ultimate purpose of information warfare? is to shape the perception, but having shaped the perception, you want to influence the behavior. So unless you are able to influence the behavior, you are not able to achieve your ends. You can get a lot of TRP ratings, but does that translate into influencing the behavior? That is important. And for that, you need to have a credible right. And the other version is also there for us to see that if you can completely block it, maybe you are still able to, con to, to manipulate the opinion of the people. However, I would support what General Chandi said, that for open democratic societies, you cannot block information. 
and therefore for us the lesson should be that we will need to build a credible narrative and create capability to build that narrative but it cannot be building all of us that that is the important issue despite the high tech precision strikes long range weapons and their destructive potential closing in and capture of objectives has still not been substituted you see the kind of counter offensive that ukraine has launched and if you are not able to hold your ground you are compelled to cede it and where you are able to hold it you are able to deny any kind of so the close contact value is still very much there despite the different models and versions and tools for deep patterns why this is happening in western world please do not forget that the so called small war or the sub conventional conflict in the levels can change still going on at a large number of places in the world large number of places. it's still going on it's just that it is off our radar at the moment so what's the lesson that you will have to be prepared for a spectrum of conflict and nobody has enough resources to have different kind of forces to meet different kind of threats and therefore your forces will have to be more adaptable more versatile and that much better trained to be able to adapt to the model of war that is there in front of you that's all i had to share or uh, more during question and answer in case we have some time thank you Thank you so much, sir. I think uh, questions will definitely. I'm sure all of us are excited to ask questions. But I think paucity of time, we'll have to skip that. But of course, they all are available off stage, so you can connect with them later. On that note, let's invite our next speaker, Colonel Baljinder Singh, is the Director of Aerospace and Defence at the United States India Strategic Partnership Forum. He is working to coordinate with defense and aerospace businesses of U.S. members with the Indian government, policymakers, and Indian businesses (MSMEs) for building strategic ties between both countries and to bring technology and capability to India. He previously worked as the additional director at the Defense Research and Development Organization, where he conceptualized and developed a policy on safety and quality online inspection of DRDO products manufactured by private vendors during the COVID-19 pandemic. Please put your hands together, ladies and gentlemen, as I invite Colonel Belinder Singh for the closing remarks. Important domains, uh, very shortly. Uh, outer space, deep space, uh, deep space, and uh, cyber domain have become formidable new uh, tools of instruments for attaining national power. Now, uniqueness of space lies in the fact that it is accessible to only very few people, very few countries, and as an emerging strategic domain. <coughs> its geopolitical importance and uh, is a topic of study today assessing the space capabilities of country and comparing it with uh, and comparing it to the capabilities that are required to dominate the space and filling up the gap is what the nations worldwide are doing the countries like us and uh, japan have been on to this for, for a while while india china and russia have de developed their anti satellite capabilities in space Uh, countries like uh, US Japan France are a step ahead by uh, making the national space force uh, as brought up evidently <clears throat> now coming to the deep oceans they have always been a very important asset uh, for all nations we remember the navies of the yester years they looked to dominate the seas and the oceans surrounding and versatile navies were al always uh, a, 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 a very important factor for <clears throat> For for the outcome of wars, the focus later, of course, shifted to the uh, air power as it came in um, uh, 19th century. But as on today, again, <coughs> deep oceans, along with air, have become very, uh, very strategically important. 
combination of technology advancement that have happened over the years, availability of rare minerals in the deep oceans, and the rising fishing demands are certain key features which have added stress and importance to the deep oceans. Just to give you some facts and figures, you know, the consumption of uh, fisheries or fish per capita in 1960 was 9.7 kg per head. Today it is beyond 20 kgs. So you can, and deep oceans provide fisheries to, to the nations. Deep, deep, deep trawling has started in the oceans. <coughs> the availability of, <coughs> sorry, the availability of ores is an important factor. Manganese is said to be available in big clumps on the, on the offshores of Papua New Guinea and the reserves are said to be almost 8% comparable to only 0.6% which are terrestrial available on land. Then coal is 3 to 5 times higher available in sea than what is available on land. Another important feature about the deep oceans is the uh, laying of the cables. Now for wanting continuous communication and data between uh, intercontinental connections, uh, we have deep cable that has been laid uh, uh, you know, across the oceans and uh, they are this is susceptible to uh, sabotage uh, as evident uh, was in the case in 2013 when <coughs> two divers of the shore of uh, Egypt had sheared off certain cables and led one of the uh, Arab countries into a uh, dark phase to, to, to be able to put a country in that many uh, period into a dark phase which can be combined with a physical attack and dominate that country is what the nations are looking for today, hence the importance of the oceans today. Uh, <clears throat> coming to cyber capability, cyber capability has already emerged as a major strategic asset for us, for, for all the nations rather. Many examples of cyber attacks uh, accompanied simultaneously with the physical attacks to bring a swift end to war is being followed as a strategy worldwide today. Now, <clears throat> Damaging economics of a country is more vital than physically damaging a country because you are also expanding your economics when you are physically doing it. Now, this fact, the fact came to be a surprise when Russia attacked Ukraine bringing this fact in, into mind, uh, what General Chandi uh, uh, had said. You know, when Russia attacked Ukraine and didn't follow up with a cyber attack was a, was a surprise. But as the war progressed, this, uh, this, this came, the, the, the emerging uh, domain of cyber warfare came into being how uh, Russia utilized this domain. There is a word called DDoS, that is Distributed Denial of Service and that is, that is what has hit Ukraine more than the physical attack. Cyber ops operations are therefore as much an arm of propaganda and meaning to create delivery of disinformation as they are tools for disrupting adversely critical infrastructure and also their military capability. The future of conflicts, as evident, will always remain in the realms of deep ocean, outer space and cyberspace. It is pertinent to engage with countries which are working in these domains and prepare well for preventing such situations leading to conflicts. If we can take a leaf out of the discussions today and from the fact that how nations are actively now exploiting these three domains to effectively impose their own will and uh, dominate the others by effective use of these domains. It will help us prepare our nations for the times ahead. With that, I put my speech to rest. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for summarizing the entire session. All right, on that note, thank you to all our speakers, all our, in our session moderator for joining this session. It was indeed a pleasure. So much of important information that they just shared with all of us, and I'm sure it's going to be very, very helpful. I could see actually we were writing and scribbling so much as and when the speakers came. So thank you very, very much. I would request you to kindly take your seat.